Bruce, you must have something really good too. Of course I do. It's Bruce Danielson, and I guess I'm here to entertain you too. statute governing powers of attorney is outdated. The oldest part dates back from 1877, actually. Um, and in the 70s, the durable power of attorneys began to be used as an estate planning tool. The old South Dakota statute was amended to allow their use and address a few specific problems, but the main statute based on the old common law was never intended to apply in this context. As a result, some elderly South Dakotans have been vulnerable to financial abuse. Frankly, this is where I come in as a financial planner and somewhat very interested in this issue related to taking care of the clients. The Elder Abuse Task Force recommended changes to the South Dakota law, and of course the Uniform Law Commission did as well. HB 1204 is based on the Uniform Power of Attorney Act drafted by the ULC, which as you know is a group of volunteer attorneys from every state, and it also was revised by the task force. So this Uniform Act has been enacted so far in 25 other states and is working as intended to help prevent financial abuse. So the main benefits of this, which you'll hear today from uh, other proponent testifiers, uh, are uh, really well captured on this page. If I could have you pass this out to the committee, uh, this will be gone over in detail uh, as well. 
But the main benefits are that the um, it gives law enforcement new tools to hold agents responsible if they abuse their position. It sets out clear standards and duties for principals, agents, and third parties who are asked to allow the agent to act on behalf of the principal. And it allows anyone who suspects financial abuse to file a report to the South Dakota Department of Social Services or ask a court to review the agent's conduct and the terms of the power of attorney, which again is where I see it from my standpoint, why my heart is in this issue is uh, related to the fact that there's not a lot I can feel like I can do today other than notate the file or fire the client. So if there's something going on with a client and there's a durable power of attorney over that client, um, it's really kind of a challenge uh, related to financial issues. This does not deal with guardianships. This does not deal in that arena. Uh, really, uh, this is, I think, narrow to financial and uh, the, uh, really the power of attorney in financial matters. So with that, I'll let uh, some further uh, experts, including uh, Associate Professor Tom Simmons, who I believe is on the floor, has further proponent testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Partridge. At this time, we would uh, take the testimony, the point of testimony from Mr. Simmons from Sioux Falls, I believe. From Vermillion. Excuse me. Go ahead and introduce yourself, and we'll take your testimony at this time. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Tom Simmons. I'm from Vermillion, where I'm employed as an associate professor by the University of South Dakota School of Law, and Chair Russell. Vice Chair Rush and other members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, I do apologize for appearing before you telephonically today. Um, thank you for permitting me to do so. I was able to testify in person as a proponent for this bill before the House Judiciary Committee, but other obligations have prohibited me from doing so today. I do come here today uh, in my individual capacity. Although I chaired the South Dakota State Bar's Uniform Power of Attorney Committee, which examined this bill in great detail, I have not been authorized to testify on this bill on behalf of the South Dakota Bar Association, the South Dakota Board of Regents, or anyone else. My re remarks here just reflect my own views. Um, some of those views are informed by my 13 years in private practice in West River, South Dakota, where I gained uh, a lot of first-hand experience with powers of attorney. So what is a power of attorney? A power of attorney is really kind of a misleading, misleading label. Um, an attorney may or may not actually be involved. A power of attorney is simply an appointment by one person, we call the principal, of another person, we call the agent, to act on his or her behalf. It's based on the idea of agency, which goes back hundreds of years. Agency arose in the commercial context, allowing employee agents to act on behalf of their employer principal in interactions with third parties in the marketplace. And during this lengthy history, the law presumed that a principal's incapacity would terminate the agency. Uh, and the agent's authority. So if a principal was uh, run over by a wagon and experienced a traumatic brain injury, the agency would be terminated. But beginning in the 1960s, states began one by one to reverse that common law rule and permit what we call durable powers of attorney, agency appointments which can survive the principal's incapacity. In fact, today most durable powers of attorney not only survive the principal's incapacity, they only become effective once the principal has lost capacity. It depends upon the drafting choices of the person putting the instrument together. And South Dakota permitted durable powers of attorney in 1977, and their use has now become very widespread as an affordable alternative to court-supervised guardianships or conservatorships. The option of a power of attorney is only available to a principal who has capacity when the instrument is signed. They have to understand what they're signing. Uh, once an incapacity occurs, the guardianship or conservatorship in front of a court is the only option for uh, getting authority over someone's financial affairs. So this Uniform Power of Attorney Act, the one on which House Bill 1204 is based, uh, was first approved in 2006 following a lengthy public drafting process. It's since been adopted in 25 states, and this year it's pending in our state as well as in Georgia, Mississippi, and D.C. What this bill is not, this act does not amend any of our guardianship or conservative statutes. And the Act does nothing with regards to health care decisions by an agent. Those statutes are all left intact and unchanged. What this bill will do, why, why we should uh, consider this bill, what it will do for South Dakotans, the State Bar Committee that did a line-by-line -line review of this Act had two aims. First was to ask whether this Act would benefit South Dakotans, 
and second, what revisions were necessary in order to ensure that the work product of the Elder Abuse Task Force 2016 uh, was preserved and integrated into this legislation. We unanimously concluded that the Act would, in fact, benefit South Dakotans. It will help in clarifying the duties of an agent acting under a power of attorney. It will allow a principal to kind of check the box for powers that they want to convey. It will help protect vulnerable principals when an agent breaches their duties. And it will add efficiencies to the marketplace where powers of attorney need to be reviewed and understood by third parties, such as banks and government agencies, by encouraging, but not requiring, a uniform format and structure to these often lengthy documents, which will reduce error rates and improve accuracy. Most of the bill's bulk is devoted to creating a framework for greater uniformity with these powers of attorney instruments. Um, but South Dakota attorneys would still be free to utilize their own kind of long-form powers of attorney instruments if they chose to do so. The rest of the bulk can be explained by clarifying an agency's responsibilities and their liability for abusing their powers. Although our guardianship statutes specify the default powers, duties, and liabilities of guardians, our current statutes for agents don't. Section 19 of the Act provides for liability when a third party wrongfully refuses to honor a power of attorney without reason or justification. This will replace a current statute, which is SDCL 59 6 11, which was enacted in 2014, and, and makes third parties liable for attorney's fees, costs, and damages for refusing to recognize the power of attorney which is which is signed. So we do have an existing statute uh, that, that exposes third parties to uh, damages uh, if, if they wrongfully <coughs> refuse to honor the power of attorney. Uh, the new section line 19 in the Act will, will narrow that liability. It will limit liability to attorney's fees only. It will limit liability to wrongfully refusing to recognize a power of attorney that follows the new standardized format and is either notarized or witnessed. And it will also provide a seven-day window for the third party to review the power of attorney before any liability could attach, and an additional five days if they request a certification of the instrument that the principal has to provide at their own cost. Because an agent's conduct, very much like a guardian's or a conservator's, isn't court-supervised, uh, <coughs> unlike a guardian or conservator's, a mechanism for correcting an agent who abuses their fiduciary responsibilities is very important. Section 15, of the Act allows a court to review an agent's conduct, just as a court would review a guardian's conduct. And a list of people who have standing to bring an agent's conduct to the court's attention includes family members, a caregiver, or even a person who demonstrates sufficient in interest in the principal's welfare. This covers the situation, for example, where an elderly person uh, has adult children, but they're all far away and not paying attention, and the only one who has any um, oversight or concern with regards to someone being taken advantage of is, say, a church friend or a neighbor. And uh, we can't guarantee that all agents will act honestly, uh, but we do need to provide a framework to the court's authority and oversight uh, when they fail to do so. That's what Section 15 does. Thank you, Chair Russell. Thank you for, thank you for your testimony. We'll hold uh, questions for a little bit. and have further proponent testimony. It's my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that you will stay on the line and provide the rebuttal. Uh, Chair, I, 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 would I would prefer to defer that because I'm unable to hear the other testimony on my phone, and I don't want to bring it up on the computer. I'm afraid that will create a weird echo and all that. But I will stay on the line. Okay, thank you. Well, then, at this time, what I would do is uh, open it up for any questions of Mr. Simmons, since he may very well um, get cut off or something. Senator Rush. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Simmons, I, I know from what I've been understanding, there's a lot of confusion about the difference between guardianships and POAs. And I was wondering if you could go into more detail in explaining exactly how those two things differ, which may be self explanatory <coughs> to lawyers, but there's a lot of people in the committee and in the audience who are not lawyers. Sure. So if I'm doing an estate plan for an individual, uh, an individual with capacity, obviously, who understands what we're talking about and what we're doing, one typical component of that estate plan, aside from the wills and so forth, are powers of attorney. And those are affordable alternatives to uh, a, a rather expensive and, and, and time-consuming court proceeding. Uh, like a guardianship. I, I call a power of attorney like a paper guardianship. 
and individuals love powers of attorney because they're able to select their agent that they will that they that they want to take care of their financial affairs if they lose competency and they're able to place some limits on their authority if they choose to do so for individuals that have failed to do that in advance um, and, and experience an incapacity i'd often get calls on the telephone said something like well dad is incapacitated we need a power of attorney can't be done because he wouldn't understand what he's signing that's where we have to go to court and the courts in our state do a great job with guardianships but they require an attorney's assistance typically you have to wait for a court date uh, it's, it's quite expensive and it's, it's something everyone I've ever talked to would prefer to avoid if they can and that's what the power of attorney alternative provides Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a, another question. In, in Section 15, uh, Mr. Simmons, I know that there's discussion in there about the presumptive heir. Uh, can you, you know, what does that mean and why don't they just say heir? Right. So uh, I can quote myself from Teaching Trust and Wills this last week where I said, uh, the living, a living person has no heirs. Um, you can you can look up in our intestacy statutes who my heirs would be if I passed away. It happens to be my wife. If my wife passed away, then my children. Um, but during a person's lifetime, you actually don't have heirs because you can only determine who a person's heirs are once they're deceased. So the word presumptive there is just acknowledging the fact that uh, as a legal matter, you don't have any heirs during your lifetime. But we could look to the intestacy statutes to see who your heirs would be if you passed away. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to be monopolizing the questions here, but I, I understand that the South Dakota Bankers Association is opposing this. Can, can you tell me what the position of the American Bankers Association has been in regard to this bill? Well, I mean, they can speak for themselves when it's their turn, but my understanding is they're particularly concerned with that Section 15, uh, with the, the, the list of, of people who would have standing to bring an agent's malfeasance to a court's attention. Uh, as well as the, the Section 19, which uh, does impose liability uh, limited to attorney's fees for third parties who wrongfully refuse to honor a power of attorney. Uh, and there's a couple other little uh, provisions that are typical in the Uniform Acts that provide principles of law, law of equity still apply and um, the remedies under the Act are not exclusive. Those are um, typical standard provisions that simply clarify that by enacting something here, uh, if there's another remedy for for an agent in particular who has taken somebody's money, um, like restitution or replevin or something like that, that would be appropriate. That the act isn't meant meaning to supplant those additional remedies against an agent who's done wrong. So under this act, is the is a banker's liability greater than it was under the old law, or or less? The, the liability is less because they're limited to liability for attorney's fees. Under the current statute, they're, limit, they're liable for damages and costs, including reasonable attorney's fees. So, for example, if a person is uh, buying a house or selling a house, would be more likely um, an individual's lost capacity and their agent is selling their house, and the other party refuses to honor the power of attorney, uh, they could be liable for the lost profits on the whole transaction. Under the new statute, the only thing they could be liable for uh, is attorney's fees. And they also have an additional window in which to conduct reviews that they don't currently have. So it's, it's both less and narrower than under current law. Further questions uh, by the committee of Mr. Simmons? <clears throat> Hearing none, we thank you uh, for being on the line and for uh, your testimony this morning. Thank you, Chair. Further proponent testimony on House Bill 1204. Good morning. Good morning. My name is uh, Corey Denovan. I'm a practicing attorney. Um, I'm testifying here on behalf of myself. Uh, I'm a partner at the Boys Law Firm in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I was born and raised in South Dakota. Um, I graduated from Augustana University and then I left out of state to go to law school and then found myself on the West Coast in Seattle, Washington. I've been practicing for about 18 years. Uh, 13 of those were in Seattle, Washington. The last five have been here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, back in my home state at the Boyce Law Firm. When I was in uh, Seattle, Washington, I was appointed by the Washington State Bar Association to serve on a task force to review the Uniform Power of Attorney Act. Uh, to go through line by line, this task force was made up of 
um, various interested parties such as bankers, title companies, financial institutions, healthcare institutions, government institutions, everyone that has some stakeholder in working with agents for a principal. Um, we spent close to two years on the, working up the Uniform Power of Attorney Act for implementation and adoption in Washington State. Um, I <coughs> spent hours and hours and hours in committee hearings uh, testifying uh, and whatnot. Um, and Luke Thomas and I were, were the chairs of that committee um, just before it was ready to be adopted or be uh, written up as a bill and, and submitted. Uh, I moved back to South Dakota. My, my uh, friend Luke Thomas went into the FBI. Um, the reason why I tell you about this experience in Washington State and dealing with the Uniform Power of Attorney Act is not to say in South Dakota we must adopt it because we did in Washington State. Um, it is because in the marketplace of ideas, this act is a good idea. It withstood argument after argument after argument in committee hearings and those types of things. It is a good idea. People did fall in line with it and people did feel it was an a, a improvement in the existing law. Uh, and the same held true when, when I fast forward four years when I'm in South Dakota, I'm asked to work with Tom Simmons and Andrew Knutson in doing a review of this act once again for South Dakota. Uh, during our conversations, there were some heated debates, discussions, but overall we felt like this was a good idea. This did have some very good um, uh, points uh, that we can use, uh, South Dakota citizens can use um, to their benefit, and we strongly uh, encourage this adoption. Now, a little bit about my practice. I represent banking institutions, mostly having to do with their fiduciary responsibilities, such as serving as trustees, serving as conservators, um, and also whether or not to uh, accept a power of attorney or how to handle a power of attorney. I'm an estate planner by trade. I draft estate plans for folks in South Dakota. Um, I draft durable powers of attorney as a part of an estate plan for almost everyone that comes to my office. I also do quite a bit of litigation. I defend fiduciaries from claims of financial uh, of, of malfeasance. I also go after fiduciaries for malfeasance. As a drafting attorney, having four out of the six states that border South Dakota have already adopted this act. And that gives me comfort because when I put in a provision or I define a provision within the act, I know that that's going to be similarly construed in those other bordering states. So I'm going to have, so when a client goes out of state, I know it's going to, the power of attorney is going to be uh, respected. When I advise a bank whether or not they should um, accept a power of attorney, um, the, the, the statutes make clear when they should do that and what they can do if they have questions about it. Currently, under South Dakota law, we have 59.7.2.1 that says a, in order for a power of attorney to be valid, it has to be witnessed and notarized. But then if you go to the liability section for a bank under 59.6.11, the liability of banks say, in order to be valid, the power of attorney only needs to be signed by the uh, by the by the, the principal. So we've got a, dis, a dis, uh, uncoupling, if you will, between those two provisions, that to the detriment of the banks. I can also advise clients when they come into my office and they ask, "What's it mean to be an agent under a power of attorney?" I can specifically say, under Section 23, if you are given certain rule, rule um, certain authority this is what it means. If I say that there is a general provision saying that you as an agent can act uh, with all the authority, the principal can act, that general grant of authority is governed by section 24 of the, the, the act, and um, it's defined. It gives them some clue as to what they should be doing. So I can advise clients better uh, if we had implemented this power of attorney. Also, a common issue is when someone comes to my office, they want to uh, appoint son and daughter as their co-agents. Well, the act makes clear that those co-agents can act independent of one another. Right now, oftentimes, what happens to a client that appoints son and daughter, if those son and daughter want to go and do something on behalf of their parent, they get jammed up because they both need to sign on the check, or they both have to sign on the contract, and that's not what was intended. Also, uh, my particular experience uh, in, this, in this realm is dealing with financial exploitation of adults. And in the last four years, I have had cases 
where uh, individuals have absconded with well over two million dollars of, of, of individuals' money. This is a rampant problem within our society, not just South Dakota, but all over the country. There's um, articles written all the time about that particular issue. These statutes make it clear and unmistakable. If you're acting as an agent for a principal, you are acting in their best interest, not your own. One of the things that we talk, tweaked in this act is section 13 that talks about the payment of the fees of an agent. Largely, when I go after a fiduciary for breach of fiduciary duty, there's three defenses that they give. One, I didn't take the money. If I, if I did take the money, it was a gift. And if it's not a gift, well, I'm entitled to fees under the power of attorney. And so, um, you know, I've worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the last three years. I'm entitled to that money. Well, Section 13 makes clear that unless you've kept <coughs> concomitant records with your actions and bill during the time that you're actually acting, you don't get that fees. That defense kind of goes away. Also, under Section 14, if there's power of attorney that limits the liability of the agent to act on behalf of the principal, um, and that agent was the one that procured the document for the person to sign, uh, those limits of liability disappear. You can't limit your liability in those situ situations if you've already had a fiduciary duty. So in other words, a caregiver working for someone has a document drafted for them that limits their liability for their actions. That's not valid under the power of attorney. Number, uh, section 16. If I go after someone who has absconded with money from a principal, I not only can recover that money that they took, but also I get attorney's fees and costs against that individual, which makes it more likely when they're facing that possibility, they're going to turn that money back over. It's easier to collect back that <coughs> money for them before the principal has lost the money. Um, section 15, as Mr. Simmons uh, points out, it's an incredibly important provision in this act. It gives the um, certain folks that if they see, that are close to the principal, and it's not far attenuated, they're, you look at the people that can bring a petition to challenge a power of attorney or look into a power of attorney, it's rather narrow in its focus. Um, and uh, they can bring, if I'm <coughs> representing the agent, for instance, and they need to know whether or not the power of attorney lets them do what they intend to do with the principal's uh, property, well, I can bring a petition to the court and ask them to construe the power of attorney to get permission rather than having to ask forgiveness later on. Also, if I represent someone that's close to the principal that's concerned about what the agent's doing, I can bring a petition to the court and challenge what they've done or what they are about to do. It, this is a very important petition. Um, as far as my blank, bank clients, in my experience, when I was working on this, these, this act in Washington State, banks loved this particular act. Why? Because under se Section 18, they know what a South Dakota compliant durable power of attorney is. It's something that's either witnessed by two people or it's notarized, and then they know it's supposed to be valid. It's compliant. I can rely on that document. Section 19, if I don't like that document, if I feel like something's going on, I can do something about it. I can ask for a certificate showing that the, the, the document is in full force and effect. I can ask for an opinion letter for counsel uh, saying that the document is in effect. And if I'm really concerned about it, I can make a claim or I can report it to the Department of Social Services so they can look into what's going on. And I can do this all without liability. These are good provisions to prevent uh, uh, vulnerable uh, uh, exploitation of vulnerable adults. Uh, finally, with the inclusion of a form within the statute, durable to power of attorney, a form into the statute, it allows people in South Dakota that might not easily be able to get to an attorney such as myself in Sioux Falls to draft their own documents, to take matters into their own hands. It's easy to understand, it's easy to use, and I think it would save people money. Actually, you know, as a transactional attorney, I find myself becoming more and more of a dinosaur all the time. With the advent of LegalZoom, I get contacted by companies all the time asking me to put in language into these decision-making algorithms so people can go online, put in certain, answer certain questions, and boom, it kicks out a power of attorney for them. What we need to help that along, because it's just a reality, it's what's happening. 
what we need to do to help that along is to clearly define the principal and agency relationship with a comprehensive statutory scheme such as the Durable Power of Attorney Act so we can define that everyone understands their roles. And then finally, in my, in my closing opinion and or closing thoughts, um, a lot's been made of the difference between a Durable Power of Attorney and guardianship. I don't want to go into too deep, much detail, but I really want to impress upon everyone that these are two different animals. A power of Attorney is a, a, a document that's signed in the privacy where someone actually takes control of their own decisions and, and nominate someone to act on their behalf. <coughs> Guardianship is something completely different. It's a creature of statute. It's a, it's a court-created monster that's, that's done through the court system. There are two different situations. So with that, I'll conclude my testimony. Thank you for your testimony. Further proponent testimony. Good morning. <coughs> Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Eric Nelson. I work for AARP South Dakota based in Sioux Falls, and uh, my responsibility is to act as our lobbyist during our legislative session. Uh, I come to you on behalf of our 105,000 members from across South Dakota and ask you to support House Bill 1204 of the Uniform Power of Attorney Act. We feel powers, power of attorneys are essential tools for delegating authority to others to handle financial matters in many situations. Power of attorney is private and there is no oversight by a court as there is supposed to be for a guardian or conservator. State laws are often unclear about the duty owed by the agent to their principal. The power of attorney has been called a license to steal and this misuse of authority is a form of financial exploitation. This concerns AARP South Dakota greatly and explains why we think it's critical that the state laws, that state laws help prevent, detect, and redress power, power of attorney abuse. While the Uniform Power of Attorney Act can't prevent bad actors from committing theft and other forms of abuse, it does set forth clear agent duties and court pro prohibitions. As has been mentioned, the Uniform Power of Attorney Act applies only to financial, transa financial transactions, not health care decisions or guardianship issues. We appreciate the South Dakota Attorney General and his office for working with us leading up to uh, the consideration of this bill in the legislature to amend it to a form that they are comfortable with. And in closing, I'll say we feel that the Uniform Power of Attorney Act is a consumer protection bill that protects vulnerable seniors from financial abuse. By enacting the Uniform Power of Attorney Act, South Dakota will strengthen its power of attorney law to better protect its residents. We ask for your vote on this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Further proponent testimony on House Bill 1204. Hearing none, proponent testimony. <coughs> Good morning. Excuse me. Mr. Chairman, uh, my name is Bruce Danielson, and I have the pleasure of, of spending a few minutes with this committee. I'm not a lobbyist. I'm representing myself. I'm from Sioux Falls. I have uh, prepared some text, but I'm hoping to get through without having used because I'm very passionate about this legislation. On the surface, I've been a proponent of the Uniform Power of Attorney Act. I, I really am. There's a lot of really good material in here. But one of the things that's happened in the putting the, of this bill together is the public has been left out of it. I've had to search out several people in, that are the sponsors, the writers of this legislation, to try and find out if we were going to be part of it. So I have been a, a strong proponent. My issue comes down to we have definitely forgotten the most important factor in this legislation, and that's the person. I've been a guardian and power of attorney and conservator for over 30 years for many people in multiple states. And I have seen issues involved with all of this as I have brought people to South Dakota to spend their final days. And I have been entrusted with these decision-making possibilities and things that are necessary. When I started reading this legislation, right on the first page, I found problems. I've read this legislation multiple times. It's 52 pages long. I hope all of you have had a chance to read and study it. 
but it is very confusing. I agree with the proponents. There are quite a few things in our current legislation that needs to be fixed, but this is the wrong fix. I believe that people of South Dakota need to be involved in this process. <clears throat> and as a, as a witness to this process, I have been the power of attorney for an individual in my family for since 2008. Without getting into too many details of it, uh, this <coughs> individual, well known by everybody to that she, that she had a power of attorney rested with me and my brother. Uh, another family member <coughs> took this individual to a notary public and had a really badly written power of attorney redone. The individual that took her to the took her to the courthouse to have this done already knew that she had the power of attorney. This person also claimed that she had dementia for four years before she did this. There's nothing in <coughs> these 52 pages that says that's not a criminal offense. This person then decided to take and haul her out to Rapid City to a house that, that she doesn't want to live in and cut her off from the rest of the family. Now she's in a guardianship situation. The judge acted in the best he could do under the situation. But to start this whole process, there was fraud and deception upon the court based on a false power of attorney. I'm not the only one. As I have been working in this process, and people know that I have this experience with power of attorneys and guardianships, they're telling me stories about their parents and how they've been taken away, how their children have been taken away by somebody who is not part of the family or somebody that has a, has a financial interest in taking over that person. And in my situation and in these other situations, once the power of attorney has been put into force, or the guardianship has been put into force, that person, that principal, can no longer hire an attorney to protect themselves. It's up to the interested parties or the families that, or whoever could be involved, and it could be a bank, that has to hire an attorney to go in and protect that person and try and get their rights back, get, try and get their property back. Another problem that I found with this, this whole process is there's, there's no set review and rejection process. I I've, I've, have gone through, and in the first 20 pages of this document, I have five pages of notes of problems with this bill that deal with the person. We have totally and completely forgotten about the the person who's in need of help. We have no definition of what impairment is, no definition of what incapacity is. We, we aren't even following standard uh, diagnostic standards manual for, for how to declare somebody incompetent or incapacity. There's a whole breakdown of this. I've talked with doctors at the major hospitals in Sioux Falls, and they've been very upset about this bill because they can't, their job is to come in after the fact and try and help the families clean up the mess. But if you aren't following this and you're going in and declaring somebody is incompetent or, or incapacity because they fell down or, or as what's happened in Arizona and, and Nevada to a great degree and it's happening in Florida and they're trying to clean up these messes, once you have a power of attorney, or I mean a power of attorney in force, then what's happening is people can go and get a guardianship on those individuals. And the person that is being forced into a guardianship has no rights to protect themselves. There's nothing in here that allows that person who is in need of help to protect themselves with their own attorney. 
one of the issues we had to fight was keeping an attorney hired for this individual. I just had a conversation, I've just met a, a woman in Sioux Falls who is, her mother turned 97 on, on Sunday. She's not been able to see her mother for three years. The power of attorney took mom away, locked her up in a nursing home somewhere and won't tell anybody where she is. They have to go to court now, apparently, to find out where mom is. And that mother had already been declared with dementia for four years and other family members took her to the took her to an attorney and had a new power of attorney done ceding power over to a different agent. There's nothing in <coughs> 52 pages that makes that criminal. There's, I really believe in this legislation. I believe in the forms. I believe in clarifying the language. One of the problems that I have found as I've gone through this is in my studies of grammar, I have found over 500 errors in grammar and, and typographical errors in this legislation, 52 pages. That's a lot of mistakes in here. And I want to talk to somebody about it, but apparently nobody really wants to talk about these issues because when I was trying to visit with authors of this legislation, uh, and I said, well, if this passes, you know, what do we do in these situations? And the answer came back is, well, you can always sue. And it's like, the, the, the funds have been depleted. Everything's gone. The, the guardianships have been taken over. My, my family members' rights have been taken over. I had to clean up a mess in the 1980s in a situation where an attorney stepped in and became a guardian for a woman he barely knew and he fleeced her estate of tens of thousands of dollars. And all I could get back was $5,000 out of him in that so I could bury her. What's happening here is we're through this type of process. We're taking a living human being that has decided that this is how they want to live and this is how they want to die. And they've put it into paperwork. They've, they have a durable power of attorney or they have a health care power of attorney. This is wiping out all of that and starting all over again, and we no longer can protect the people that we love. And I thank you very much for your time today, and you can tell I'm a little passionate about it. I have some information I would like to leave with all of you when it's all over with. Thank you for your testimony. Further open testimony. Mr. Chairman, committee members, my name is Brett Kelly. I'm a lawyer from Pierre and I'm a registered lobbyist for the South Dakota Bankers Association. Um, I'll respond initially to one of Senator Rush's questions. The American Bankers Association has had concerns about this legislation from the get go. They started raising their concerns prior to its adoption by the Uniform Law Commissioners. I'm here to tell you I don't share all of the concerns that ABA raised, but I share a number of them, and I'll go through them here this morning. The first thing I want to tell you is that despite the claims of the proponents, the current power of attorney statutes are working just fine. There's no hue and cry in South Dakota from the bar, or from the banks, or from the people who use powers of attorney on a daily basis for change in the laws. That simply isn't happening. It's not going on anyplace. Are there hiccups? Yes, there are here and there because there are thousands of people <coughs> using powers of attorney to do business for their family members and their business associates all the time. Those things happen and they're being handled routinely and easily by people under the current statute without the assistance of the Uniform Powers of Attorney Act. I object to Section 15 of the code, or the, the proposed bill. I object to line 7 on page 12, where we, we give people the ability to petition a court to, quote, construe a power of attorney or review the agent's conduct. Ladies and gentlemen of the committee, typically when you approach a court seeking relief, seeking an order from the court, you outline specific things that have been done wrong and you ask for a specific remedy. 
Line 7 is a license to start a fishing expedition. And to get, add insult to that injury, it gives fishing licenses to in, up to and including a church friend, as we heard in the proponent testimony. That's akin to giving mothers the right to start divorce actions between their happy uh, son or daughter and his or her spouse. I think this statute goes way too far in giving standing to people who know only a small portion of a story to go to court and start trouble between family members. People who are probably having a difficult time enough dealing with mom or dad's issues and here you go, here's a license to go to court and start some trouble over that. I would hope you'd all take some pause before giving people standing to go to court to ask for in-specific remedies as it's, it's granted in section 15. Going further down the list, I'll go to section 19. <laughs> a person shall accept a South Dakota compliant power of attorney, fair enough. But then you, it continues, you shall accept, you shall accept. We had a summer study, I believe it was summer of 15, the Bankers Association participated and the Chief Justice convened it, perhaps some of you recall that. And we talked about how banks and bankers and bank tellers are on the front lines of stopping elder abuse, elder financial abuse, because of their ability to look at a power of attorney or document that's been presented and put up a roadblock and say, hey, wait a minute, I'm not sure something's right here. But yet we say, shall accept, shall accept, we shall accept. We may not require a different or additional power of form of power of attorney. There's not may accept in there. You shall accept. And oh, by the way, going further down to section 3, which is on page 16, if you do refuse to accept that power of attorney, you're liable for attorney's fees. Well, thanks very much for stop trying to stop somebody's elder, potential elder abuse. I submit to you this is going in the wrong direction. And I'm confused why we would take a turn in the direction that we set just a few short years ago in that section of this code. I, I don't understand that for the life of me. Further down, section 20, the principles of law and equity apply. I think I know what that means, but I'm not sure that anybody in this room would agree on what that means. I would, I would submit to you that it's a much better proposition to have the bill say this is the remedies that the court is prescribed to hand down. Instead, it's a license to do whatever the court thinks is best. Sometimes that's good and sometimes it isn't, but you're giving the court the authority to do that. I don't think that's a good idea. Finally, I object to section 22, where it says the remedies are not exclusive and do not abrogate any other right or remedy. So we're gonna, we're gonna have a court action, but it's not gonna be final. It's not gonna decide everything. We're gonna have it opened up to, well, we can have it come back and try again here. I, I don't think that's right either, ladies and gentlemen. The law favors repose, which means airing out your differences, coming up with a remedy, and moving forward. And this is directly opposite to that. I'm here to tell you, I, I don't care what the Washington State banks thought about this. I, I'm here to tell you what, I, what the South Dakota experience is. The current law is working, and this bill is, in some respects, not a step in the right direction. I have brought with me an amendment which would take those four sections out if anybody's interested in doing so and moving forward. I don't have objections at all for this committee to the rest of this bill. But the current system is working and this bill in some respects is a step in the wrong direction. And I would ask you to take a hard look at it before you pass it out. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is A.J. Franken, and I'm General Counsel in Governor Dugard's office, and I rise in opposition to 1204 this morning. 1204 is a 52-page uh, solution looking for a problem, and, and I don't think that's the correct approach that we should take uh, toward our law in South Dakota. Um, there's no major problem, as, as uh, Mr. Kennedy just said, uh, no hue and cry out there the powers of attorney uh, laws in South Dakota are working well. Um, there, there are real problems with uh, uh, 
powers of attorney being uh, abused and being misused because there are criminal actors out there and, and that, that can't be stopped. We have had legislation in the past to look at that issue very closely and I think the Chief Justice led a, a great effort to uh, address those problems and we recently uh, fixed a lot of those uh, statutes with regard to that specific abuse. It's noteworthy that this bill was not endorsed by the State Bar Association. It was not endorsed by a standing committee of the bar. It has been endorsed by individual members of three attorneys that, that looked at it uh, at the direction of the bar. Three, three individual attorneys, not the whole bar. Uh, you heard about the process in Washington, and I think that sounded like it was a pretty good process that the state of Washington went through, including uh, consumer groups, bankers, individuals that are affected by the powers of uh, attorney, and individuals who work with that law every day. That process has not happened in South Dakota with regard to this bill. And uh, as such, what we're getting here is, is a uniform law that was uh, by various attorneys in places distant uh, and is being crammed into our code uh, as a solution to South Dakota problems uh, when the solution was written when the problems weren't in front of that group. Um, with regard to specifics, uh, from time to time agencies uh, come to me with uh, asking questions about opinions on, on the way a law should be construed. Uh, one, uh, one kind of specific that was troubling to me is uh, to determine incapacity, there's, there's a few different individuals that can determine incapacity for powers of attorneys that kick in once incapacity is, is, uh, is determined. Uh, that can be determined under this by a physician or a licensed psychologist, a judge, an attorney. Uh, the, the last one in that list is, is troubling to me, an appropriate governmental official. Um, if uh, someone at a state agency uh, comes to me and, and, and asks, uh, who, who is an appropriate governmental official to determine whether someone is incapacitated and this power of attorney should go into effect, uh, I would be unable to give them an answer. Uh, the bill gives no guidance as to what would make that person an appropriate or an inappropriate person to deem the person incapacitated? Is it a counselor? Is it anyone that works at DSS? I don't know. There's no guidance under this statute. As to the form, I don't think uh, this makes the process easier. In order to, uh, you, you heard kind of the, the competing thing, uh, LegalZoom, uh, or other online processes that ask you different questions and, and, and based on your responses to those questions could, could help you draft something particular to your needs. Uh, in this bill, it puts in form a statutory form. It's a dozen some pages long. Um, but to understand that, you have to look at the definitions in dozens of other pages. And so what we have here is a form without that kind of questions and prompting, but a form that could just be printed off by an individual and you start checking boxes. Uh, if you've read through the entirety of the bill, uh, you can appreciate that it is not, uh, it's not a light read. Uh, it's not uh, something that you can, you can sit down and, and understand quickly and easily. And so uh, there's concern that I think if we put a form in the statute, that uh, it's going to encourage people to use that without actually reaching out to the rest of the code to fully understand what they are doing there. Uh, currently, if you're going to do something complex with your power of attorney, you're going to sit down with an attorney, uh, most likely, and you're going to work through those questions. And the attorney is going to going to be a check to make sure that you understand what's uh, what you're granting when you're checking each box. Um, this makes it easier for people to go it alone. Um, I, I think that, that probably is a true statement, uh, but it's also easier to make that person go it alone and, and make mistakes in that process on a form that, uh, that the, the legislature would have put in the code book for them to use. Uh, maybe you've read this bill in entirety and say, yes, this is addressing a host of specific problems that constituents have approached me with that aren't being resolved 
by the current statute. Uh, and maybe you think this isn't narrowly tailored to meet those specific problems. Chances are that's, that's not the case, though. Uh, I this bill is unnecessary, and it's not solving any problems that we have in South Dakota. And so that I, I would ask for you to vote no on 1204 this morning. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Further open testimony. Hearing none, we have given you an opportunity for the vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll be brief because I know your schedule is extensive this morning, uh, so we'll try to get moving along. But um, just a little bit of history. Three years ago, I actually brought this bill. Um, I was a brand new legislator, and I brought the uh, longest bill ever uh, for a new legislator. And uh, uh, so in terms of the public being left out, that's just simply not true. We had that you know, as part of this process. Um, it was in House Judiciary at the time. Um, publicized and on, um, you know, the internet and everything else. So it, it's been something that has been out there that's been discussed. There's been a number of attorneys who have offered their opinions. Um, the state and planning attorneys are somewhat um, specific in what they do. I mean, there is a lot of different laws and things that go into that. So it's a pretty specialized um, craft within the bar. And I think those who um, participated in the conversations um, had, had a lot of opportunity to provide um, feedback. I, you know, some of the situational concerns of the opponent might be valid, um, but they're, they don't apply here. Uh, this is not power of attorney for health care. Um, this is not guardianships or conservatorships. This is the financial power of attorney. And, and really um, addressing the issue of the fact that this, this is a, a problem or a solution looking for a problem, a classic thing. Um, there is a problem that we have in the state. And the, as I mentioned, why I'm a proponent or why I'm a prime sponsor of this bill is the, the problem that I struggle in my practice with the decoupling of abuse um, and exploitation of power of attorneys um, with financial matters. And if I can't do anything about it, I mean, or provide any sort of remedy to the situation, my remedy that I've been advised to do is to basically fire the client. And that's, I get what, uh, you know, maybe banks don't want to do that or whatever, but I mean, that's been the remedy that we've had to go through as financial advisors, is to say, hey, this, uh, we, we brought this to the attention, we've written a letter to the file, we documented it, and finally, it's just I can't, you know, continue in good faith to be a, a, the practicing advisor in this situation. So they go find another advisor that probably takes two or three years to figure it out, and the, the cycle continues until the money's gone. So this is a uh, important step for us to move forward, just on that piece of it alone, related to powers of attorney for financial matters. Um, I would consider amendments to uh, the bill on Friendly, and I would ask you to uh, really uh, oppose them. Uh, this bill in its entirety has been vetted extremely well, and I ask for your favorable consideration of uh, this bill as it is. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Partridge. At this time, I will open up to any questions. Senator Nelson. Thank you, sir. Question for the prime sponsor. This is you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Partridge. You want Mr. Partridge to answer it? I'm going to defer to Corey, actually. Okay. Thank you. Um, have you folks seen Mr. Danielson's exhibit to the, the committee? Sure. Ask if you folks had looked through each one of his points and, and if you wish to rebut or expand or uh, respond to them. I mean, Mr. Danison's gone through here very thoroughly. I guess he raised quite a few points. I was just curious if you folks had seen it and if you'd had a chance to or cared to respond to, to sure. them. 
Sure, and, and I'm sympathetic to this plight um, that he described in his testimony earlier today. Um, there, what the Durable Power of Attorney Act is trying to do is provide relief to individuals that find themselves exactly in the situation that he did. He had a power of attorney that was in effect, that it was, that it was valid, he was serving as the agent, and someone else went out and procured a new power of attorney. Well, with Section 15, that provides the ability to go to court and for the court to declare which power of attorney is in effect. It provides that court remedy of, uh, to, to Mr. Danielson in that scenario. Then we take it, let's assume that for whatever reason, the power of attorney just isn't working out. Uh, people can't agree on what's in the best interest of the principal, whatever the case may be. The court has to take control of the situation. They, they uh, terminate the power of attorney, establish a guardianship and conservatorship, which is under court, continued court supervision, and they direct the agent how to act in the best interest of the principal. And that's, so the Power of Attorney Act would help um, Mr. Danielson's situation, and it makes it pretty clear of what you can do to go to the court and uh, construe um, the document, the government instrument. Okay. Further committee questions? Sure. I do have a question just to make sure for our LRC staff. Will Mr. Danielson's handout be included on their, our committee today? Okay, thank you. For the questions, then, members of the committee. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think I have several questions, if I might, Mr. Chair. <coughs> First of all, it's been brought up that there's no definition under this section of impairment or incapacity. Um, is it your assertion that those <coughs> words not be, not need to be defined? Actually, in, in section one, uh, subparagraph five, incapacity is defined as an inability of an individual to manage property, business, or financial affairs of the individual. And it also defines other things that qualify as incapacity. And that becomes particularly relevant when you have a power of attorney that is, an effective, that is not effective upon signature by the principal, but rather depends on a finding of incapacity to trigger for it to spring into effect, so to speak. So incapacity is defined. And it's, for the most part, it's a legal conclusion rather than a medical conclusion. You said for the most part, I guess I'm curious about that, because I've heard cri a criticism of this bill is that it may extend into guardianship. You say that it's <coughs> there's a clear line. Right. <coughs> yes. Within the guardianship statutes, one of the, one of the, with the court, with the, guardianships are an extreme measure. Or guardian, they are, you're taking away someone's civil rights in a guardianship for all intents and purposes and appointing someone else to act on their behalf. A power of attorney is a less restrictive alternative to, to that. It's someone that can actively, when they're able to manage their financial affairs, they can appoint someone to act on their behalf. The reason why I say incapacity is defined as a legal conclusion rather than a medical conclusion for the most part. Um, there is a provision that you can later on in the act that if you can have a determination by two physicians to find them to be incapacitated. So what the physicians are going to do if they are the ones called upon to make that determination of incapacity, they're not really so much going to look at the functional limitations, but maybe the more of the medical the medical conclusions as far as incapacity. Okay. Um. One of, the, one of the opponents spoke to the language contained, I think, within section 22, I don't recall for sure, but it says any, or an appropriate government official. And I don't know if you recall the, the testimony, but I'll try to pull it up. Sure. I mean, and this is going off the top of my head, um, that's a very uncommon occurrence where we've ever, I've ever had a situation where uh, uh, a government official has to make a declare, uh, decision that someone is incapacitated. But I can think of one situation that I had, and this was again on the West Coast, 
where a longshoreman fell off a boat and the Coast Guard had to determine that he had been missing for a particular period of time. And when you're missing, that is one of the section, one of the provisions in here that meets the criteria of incapacity. Uh, incapacity. So that's the one situation that I can think of. Okay, then I guess for clarification, that's in section eight. I mentioned the wrong section. Um, do you think that that's? Do you think that that language is overly broad? I expect your answer to be no, and I guess I would ask furthermore why, because an, an appropriate government official just seems to me to be wide open. Well, I, I will say that no, it's, 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 I think we're talking about a red herring in most instances because when powers of attorney are drafted, I would say 80 to 90 percent of them are effective immediately. It doesn't take any other finding of incapacity whatsoever. Um, I don't think that um, if we, if you do have a springing power of attorney, uh, again, most of the time those determinations are either made by a court or uh, by a um, physician, a treating physician. I, like I said, in my 18 years of practice, I've only had one situation where we were looking to a government entity to make it determined that the person was missing long enough for it to be determined missing and incapacitated for the purpose of a power of attorney. So I don't think I, I think we're I think we're chasing uh, a very a uh, red herring. Um, I think that's all I have. Sir, for you, Mr. Danielson. Sir, I'm. I guess I'm trying to lead through all this, and my question is: You said something at the outset of your testimony that I guess I I found I found it require a deeper dive, and you talked about bringing people to South Dakota to spend their final days. And my question is, do you feel that this, that this bill wades into um, guardianship or conservatorship, or, or are you speaking more generally to um, just financial decisions relative when, to their you know, final day? Using the definition that, that has been just given about incapacity and impairment, in that situation that I was just telling you about, this this woman uh, was in her late years, and she was no longer in control of her faculties. And I was able to bring her to South Dakota from Iowa, where I run into the issue that I think you're you're driving at is the research I've done, the experience that I've run into with my family, the half a dozen or so people that I have talked to just from Sioux Falls in the, in the last two weeks since I started this quest to get something done on 1204. They tell me, each one of them tells me how this is stepping closer. As soon as you put into effect the power of attorney and somebody goes and, and in our mind, criminally changes a power of attorney, we have to fight to stop a guardianship process usually. There's, because once we start arguing, as what happened in, in our case, once the family started trying to find a solution, the judge gave up and did a guardianship. When I looked into what is happening in Arizona, Nevada, and Florida through this kind of a, a setup, if somebody has a power of attorney in effect, just like what happened in my family and with Tanya's family, all of a sudden, while you've already decided that they're incapacity or impaired, somebody else can come in and certified guardianship businesses are being advertised through several elderly organizations about, you know, you can have your life saved through and your property saved through certified guardians and these certified guardians go in and they are actually going in and taking the 
the rights away from the individual. They don't even know that this is happening. They don't even know that somebody is, is trying to take away their rights. Just because a daughter has a power of attorney, all of a sudden somebody can walk in and say, let's have a, you know, we can set up a doctor, we can set up a, a lawyer, we can set up the whole process. And in some states, we don't go, they don't go to full judges, they go to administrative judges. So when we talk about uh, appropriate government official, now we're talking about what's happened in Nevada with the, with the, the administrative process that can declare somebody in guardianship just because they had a power of attorney and it was stripped away. There's, there's no protections for the people in this. I'm sorry, I got long-winded. That's all right. We do that often. Um, I guess I think that's the only question I have for you, um, and I appreciate it, sir. Um, okay. Thank you. I guess, Mr. Franken, if I could ask a question to you, sir. Um, what would your take be on the question that I just posed about whether this wades into um, the discussion about guardianship or conservatorship? Is there is this, in your humble opinion, um, is this bill constructed in a way that establishes some well-defined lines, or is it not? Mr. Chair, uh, as, as far as well-defined well lines, I think uh, powers of attorney and guardianships and conservatorships, uh, they can <coughs> often happen along a progression of, of uh, a person's experiences in life. Um, I think there, there are um, some uh, uh, protections, some, some uh, barriers put in place with this statute, but I, I think to go back to the process, I think it's important that that uh, be, be vetted through with, uh, for example, the individuals that really took a close look at the guardianship conservatorship statutes. I was, I was not part of that process. To, to look closely at those, and so I, I don't know if I can I can speak uh, uh, very knowledgeably as to uh, what there may or may not be problems with the line between those two. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, one one last question of any of the proponents, <coughs> and that would simply be: um, I know that the prime sponsor has said that he would oppose any. Um, in any attempt to amend. I guess, sir, I, if you would like to answer this, um, my question is, if the four sections or any one of the four sections that are spoken to in the amendment were to be stricken, uh, what is the net effect on the bill? Does it effectively gut the entire bill or does it just leave you with, with certain remnants that you know are, are, still, are still good but um, I guess I'd like your your take on whether or not that's something that could be done and give you, you know, a real victory and yet address their concerns as well. Sure. I'll take it section by section. Section 15, if we were to get rid of that particular section, um, that give, gets rid of the court process that would allow an agent to have a, their durable power of attorney construed or for someone to challenge an action or an activity by an agent on behalf of the opponent. Uh, yeah, maybe we'll cut to the chase. Um, do you agree with uh, Senator Partridge that the amendment as proposed would, would uh, be a hostile amendment? Yes, it, absolutely, it because if this is a uniform act, it should be enacted as in, in its total. Sure. That actually does lead to one more question. I know that there was a little bit of amending done on the House side, and I'm curious as to if if <coughs> effectively changed this Uniform Act in such a way that I mean, how, why why the amendment if this is a Uniform Act? I think there was just I wasn't here for that. There was a, a they removed one word before okay. out of confusion, so. That was the, they didn't move for moving a particular section. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Greenfield. At this time, I'd like to move into um, 
Do you have more questions? I, I just have a couple. Okay. Thank you. And if you well, Mr. Denovan, uh, I, just to clarify, I've been working with Section 7, Subpart 2 of the bill. Uh, does that not draw a pretty clear line between powers of attorney, conservatorships, <coughs> and guardianships? It, it absolutely, you're absolutely correct. Um, if a guardianship is enacted, the the power of attorney ceases to have any effect whatsoever. So you don't have two agents acting on behalf of the principal. And may I follow up? Sir. Uh, and just for the people who are not lawyers in the room, a guardianship or a conservatorship is a court-appointed, court-supervised process. Is that correct in South Dakota? That's absolutely correct. Um, one other, if I may. <coughs> Looking at section 19 of the bill, one of the opponents uh, referenced the terms, quote, shall accept. Um, am I correct in reading section 19 that that shall accept language gives a period of several business days for a person to determine whether or not they shall accept a power of attorney? That's absolutely correct. And does it also, in subpart 2, sub E, protect a person who in good faith believes the is not valid? That's correct. It also provides remedies to them to challenge the case. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to open up the committee discussion and action. Senator Rush. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> There are reasons for uniform acts. Um, one of the reasons is to have rules consistent from state to state. You know, if you do a power of attorney in South Dakota and you move to Minnesota or Nebraska or Iowa and you don't have a consi consistent act, um, you know, that makes the power of attorney continuing uh, when you go from state to state. To state. And I think the testimony was that there have been 23 or 24 states that have enacted this this uniform act so you know that's really important with our global society that we have today <coughs> it also reduces the need for individuals and businesses to deal with different laws from state to state you know if you've got um, <coughs> target that has businesses in multiple different states and they can rely on the fact that south dakota's law is consistent with minnesota law it certainly makes them easier to do business here in South Dakota. So there's real reasons for having a uniform law. It doesn't mean that we should give up uh, the rights and the protections that we have prepared uh, here in South Dakota for, for our citizens. Uh, there was a reference made that uh, financial exploitation of the elderly is, is rampant. And based upon my experience in court and my regular reading of the South Dakota Supreme Court decisions that come down, I'd have to agree with that. And I think Mr. Danielson is the one that brought, brought that up. Um, and, and the reasons for that is that there are uh, elderly people that have a great deal of money and family and non-family members who, who would like to get their hands on that. And I don't think there's a month goes by that there isn't a... Supreme Court decision dealing with some kind of financial exploitation that, that took place of elderly people. But I, I think the objections going to this act are, are misplaced in that respect. Um, the, 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 the information that Mr. Danielson handed out is, is, is certainly uh, concerning as it applies to guardianships. And remember that the guardianship is somebody who's been appointed by the court, um, not necessarily somebody who's in the family. The power of attorney is something that is chosen by that person who, who selects somebody to handle their affairs. Now, maybe they make a bad decision and they pick somebody that abuses their, their trust, but by and large, the power of attorneys that are going to be appointed are, you know, I'm going to appoint my son 
as a power of attorney if I get where I feel that that's going to be necessary and hopefully he treats his sister well, which if you read the cases you see that isn't always necessarily true. But, um, you know, this is, is not a progression from POAs into guardianships. Um, that only occurs if somebody goes to court. I, I would guess that the vast majority of powers of attorney do not progress into guardianships. Um, and it's only where there are questions of capacity where it progresses uh, in, into uh, guardianships. Um, and, you know, there are ways, and, and I'm, I'm concerned about some of the examples that Mr. Danielson said gave about guardianships. Uh, there are specific statutes in South Dakota's guardianship statutes, which are not affected by this at all, <coughs> which require that a person who is, where they are asking guardianship, that that person is required to have either an attorney or a court-appointed agent to represent them in those guardianship proceedings. You know, I've had multiple examples when lawyers have shown up and said, well, we need a guardianship, but, and they haven't done that. And, you know, my practice always was, well, then you go get, the, get an attorney appointed. For this person because it's required by by law here in South Dakota and and that doesn't stop uh, the, the financial exploitation but um, it, it isn't the power of attorneys that are the problem with that the power of attorney gives the person more freedom to pick the person that they want to handle their affairs and we heard about one power of attorney and then somebody else uh, comes in and gets another power of attorney and you know, when you have feuding children, that's certainly a possibility, and that's why Section 15 is so important, where it gives you the, the alternative to go in and get the court to construe uh, which power of attorney is, is the appropriate power of attorney to, uh, to, to control in that situation. And so that's, I think Section 15 is, is super important, and, you know, yeah, it's written broadly to try and... Uh, um, make sure that the people going in to seek court instructions are, are people that have at least some connection. And, uh, you know, what, certainly that would allow a stranger to do that, but I think courts, when they're construing POAs, can certainly sort out if the person is really someone who uh, doesn't have enough of an interest and there isn't a violation uh, that's going on. Uh, in those cases. There are lots of different statutes that direct the people to go into court and, and seek court directions about what to do. Um, you know, I, the testimony of, of uh, Professor Simmons was that, uh, you know, this actually reduces the potential liability from the banks and, you know, I, I carefully looked at this in the old statute and, and I would tend to agree that it does reduce the potential liability as long as the bank is acting in good faith. If, if they're not acting in good faith, then, um, then they may have to pay attorney's fees, but that's less than what's allowed under the old, the old statute. So I would encourage people to support this bill. Further discussion and action, Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just add uh, a couple of points. I looked at this bill carefully before I agreed to sign on as a co-sponsor. What I found, in addition to what the judge uh, just spoke about in this bill, that I found beneficial, I think this bill creates much more clarity for people who are assisting folks in creating powers of attorney or people who have powers of attorney or are acting as agents under powers of attorney. This bill creates very specific statements of what authority is granted, what authority is not granted. Uh, you know, it's essentially a checklist. And I can tell you that as someone who has drafted these and advised people on both creating powers of attorney and exercising or executing powers of attorney, that's going to be helpful. That's going to be useful to the people of South Dakota. Uh, I agree with what uh, Senator Rush said. I think this is a good bill. I like the fact that we're trying to get consistent with states that surround us uh, because people are mobile. Nothing we do is going to prevent 
bad actors from doing bad acts. That just can't be stopped. But I agree that this gives us a better way than the current law to try to control people who take advantage of or abuse powers of attorney. Now, one last comment, and I know people can do these without the assistance of a lawyer, but I will tell you that if someone comes to a lawyer to ask for a power of attorney, it's the lawyer's ethical obligation to determine that the person signing that power of attorney is competent at the time they sign it and is capable of signing it. And I believe most lawyers in South Dakota uphold their ethical obligations and don't just go handing these things out because somebody asked for them. Thank you. Further discussion and or action? Senator Rush. I would move to pass. Second. We have a motion by Senator Rush, seconded by Senator Kennedy to pass on House Bill 12. Any discussion? I, uh, <clears throat> because we haven't had any uh, discussion, and I know that this is probably confusing to many members of the committee. Uh, I, when I first heard of the bill, uh, based upon the fact that it's a uniform law, I was, I was, uh, thought, well, there wouldn't be any objection to that. It would be rather not much pressure. Um, Having said that, the testimony here today, I think um, the fact that we have, the, and I, the bar is in the room, but they took a pass on it, which I think is kind of interesting in and of itself. But the, the governor's office actually, in my estimation, had some really important testimony here today. Now, I understand that uh, further clarification is usually exactly what we want to do and we want to make it uh, more clear as to who has certain rights and responsibilities in this situation and provide forms for those individuals. My concern with this bill is the, the fact that I think that it gives um, the, the, these standing provisions giving individuals that may have some nefarious motives on their own part, um, some caregiver, somebody else who doesn't like what's going on in terms of who the power of attorney is. It, it concerns me that we're broadening who can essentially meddle in what is going on um, for whatever reason, and that we give certain broad broad jurisdiction to the court to um, allow somebody into the process that may very well, I can, I, having, having drafted a number of these things and dealing with people and wills and, and this kind of business, all too often there are family members who get at it for whatever reason and and may not have the best motive. So I'm a little bit concerned about how broad it is. I wish that the bar had provided us with a little bit better, um, a, little, a little more input into this process because I am somewhat concerned about it. And so I won't be supporting the bill. I understand that we probably have, we, we do have quite a bit of support in the committee, but I would, I would tend to err on the side of um, we may even get a veto on this thing. Uh, it probably is not appropriate to pass it in its current form without more input from the bar and others um, at, to go forward. The fact that only that only the states in as many years as this has been out there have, have not enacted it, um, that also is somewhat concerning to me. I don't, I don't completely. Um, I just, my fears on this particular bill are there, and I think that it would take, there's no immediacy here where these folks can go back to the drawing board and come back before us in a year and, and have more of a consensus about what we're going forward with rather than trying to force this thing under these circumstances. So with that, 
I'd ask that if there are any further discussions that the secretary call the roll. Senators Greenfield? No. Kennedy? Aye. Langer? Aye. Nelson? No. Netherton? No. Rush? Aye. Russell? No. The do pass motion fails. Further committee action. I would move to the bill. Actually, I have a second. We have a second by Senator Greenfield. That's an unbidden motion. All those in favor will say aye. All opposed say nay. The Secretary of Public. Senators Greenfield? Aye. Kennedy? No. Mayor? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Netherton? Aye. Rush? No. Russell? Aye. Motion passes. The next bill on our agenda is House Bill 1230, an act to provide for the primary enforcement of law for getting certain electronic mass communications while operating a motor play again. Proponent testing. Okay. Representative Hall. I'm headed that way. Okay. I get through. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Committee members, it's kind of like a house reunion over here, I've noticed. I am enjoying it. What's the discussion this time? Uh, I've only got one line on 1230 that we're changing. And we're taking the text of bill that we had passed, and it, where we had made it a secondary offense, this changes it to a primary offense. And it leaves the penalty at a petty offense with a $100 fine. 